Hey guys, before I start, thank you so much for everything this year. Support of the Punch-Out! series, breaking 10,000 subscribers, being able to release the Dragon Quest V video. We've been able to be real experimental and try out a lot that's been real near and dear to us this year. And it's all because of your support and viewership. You guys looking into these videos has really kept that passion and this channel alive. And that way, we're indebted to you. Thank you. With that said, uh, this December we just want to relax a bit. Thought it'd be fun for both Gooms and myself to talk about our favorite games in an easy-to-digest list, just so you can get a better idea of where we're coming from on game design things and what we like to look out for. Be forewarned that these aren't qualitatively the 10 greatest games ever made. We're opinion machines, not statisticians. These are the 10 games that have had the deepest impact on each of us, are the most fun to replay, and that we just genuinely value our time with over other titles. And we did both grow up with Nintendo console-centric households, so fair warning if games from the big end tend to pop up a bit more frequently. With that said, it's a top 10 list. I'm Peer. I'm lonely, please follow me on Twitter. You know what you're getting into. I'm avoiding spoilers for all the games listed, and I just want to have fun with this, so let's talk about video games. Also, honorable mentions! Finally, a boss fight. Trying to describe why God Hand is good to someone who's never played it is probably one of the most foolish tasks imaginable. It looks hideous, it's got weird tank controls, it reviewed so poorly that it's a meme, it doesn't look nearly as flashy or polished as its character action brethren like Devil May Cry 3 or Bayonetta, but that's the joy of God Hand. It doesn't care. It's just happy to be its own weird, incredibly celebratory little thing. There's no other game that plays or feels quite like God Hand does. And in specializing exactly what its strengths are to an absolutely absurd degree, it becomes, well, my, my 10th favorite game of all time. God Hand is, ostensibly, what happens when you translate a 2D beat-em-up into 3D space while trying to make it exactly as accurate as possible. Your main character, Gene, is always locked into what's ahead of him by his tank controls, making any fight beyond a one-on-one -on -one difficult. Enemies and recolors thereof frequently pop out and say stupid things like, YOU'RE NOT ALEXANDER! You heal using giant fruit and sexy magazines to increase your health and heat. But eventually, everything just clicks into place, and you get one of the most expressive brawlers imaginable. Being locked into one enemy makes them a huge combo showcase, juggling their bodies like ragdolls with reckless abandon. However, due to the lacking AoE options at Gene's disposal, you always have to be aware of your surroundings, always ready to dodge. This is further complemented by the roulette wheel, which lets you get out of jail free or end a combo when your enemy is about to come out of stun, or when you're about to eat an attack from the side. God Hand practically demands that you learn all of the little idiosyncrasies of your foes. And then, it goes one step further. Every single one of Gene's attacks, every punch, every launcher, every super, is customizable. You can choose and break down every individual action in your combo. What attacks will link into what. Whether you want a super slow and weak punch that charges up your god gauge, or a launcher that hits high. Whether you want a fast combo or a drunken swagger midway through, they'll dodge attacks from the right. Whether you want to charge through enemies or make them explode and turn into fireworks. God Hand just loves video games. Character action, beat-em-ups, fighting games, stupid side mini-games, gambling. Everything is represented not in references and nods, but in mechanics. 
God Hand is a game that simply feels good to play. A stiffer, crunchier version of its competition that invites you to laugh at and with it in equal measure. If you just like seeing everything that your character can do, messing around with different builds, and having them tested in a hard-as-nails brawler that will make you humble, I can't recommend this enough. And heck, I didn't even get to talk about the boss whose background music is all Elvis noises, or the poison chihuahua, or the demon disguises a human disguises a gorilla disguises a luchador. God Hand is zany goodness, never taking itself seriously, but always trying to one-up itself in being a celebration of all the punchy-type games that came before it, and explore their ideas in as many ways as possible. Best 3.7 out of 10 I've ever played. So, we, we can agree that Smash is pretty fun, right? Beating up friends in a four, sometimes eight player fracas where you're constantly adapting to a shifting stage and items, but having a complex mechanical underbelly that's enticing to develop your skill at, all while playing as video games all-stars and also Corrin, sells itself, right? Well, it certainly did for me. Smash was a dream of getting to play as a ton of my favorite characters together while sharing that love with friends. As a Kirby fan pre-Smash, getting to introduce so many people to why the pink puffball is so cool and fun was probably the first validation I got for really engrossing myself in a fandom. Smash is a bridge to so many other worlds, other fandoms, and memories of gaming that everyone who's a part of it shares, all in an incredibly well-built and really fun package. So. Why Melee? Why not the one that has King K. Rule in it? Or the one with the super in-depth story mode? Or the one with King K. Rule in it? I am so happy he's here. Well, first off, Melee is just crunchy. You die in an instant in Melee. Items kill you faster and can actually kill you without being a Pokeball or a collection of three item. Having your character pinball around after getting hit hard is just fun. There's a reason why Temple is such a great time in Melee, but kind of a drag in all the sequels it pops up in. And the lethality of the game has more than a little to do with it. The frenetic pacing of Melee and lack of survivability options compared to later installments honestly makes it my go-to casual Smash game. And I tend to find that because of the speed at which you die, Melee has a better grip on that feeling of Okay, but one more match. But more than that, Melee just does celebration better than any of the other titles. Every fighter gets their own break the targets, their own event matches, every franchise getting two stages unless they're retro or fire emblem. The adventure mode was a journey through various Nintendo worlds, with their own unique set pieces to play around on and with. Even get cute little bonuses at the end of matches that I miss dearly, rewarding you for fulfilling silly objectives through a fight, sometimes making cute references all the while. And through the process of going through the game, unlocking every fighter, you get a feel for what makes each of them and their world special. I love feeling how each different character handles the Metroid escape sequence, or learning how Young Link's boomerang works from his Break the Target stage, or that this Ganondorf guy was strong enough to take on Link and Zelda at the same time, and evidently wasn't from Soul Calibur like I first thought. Instead of packing itself to the brim with content, Melee made absolutely sure to make the most out of all of the content it had, and in doing so, showed a love for all the video games and characters inside that was absolutely infectious. I care a lot more about a Yumi Tachibana based on her Melee trophy than I do Girl from Hajimari no Mori, know what I'm saying? Melee made me want to play other games in a good way. 
And while other characters like Snake and Steve and Terry do a fantastic job endearing themselves to both their fans and newcomers alike, nothing matches that joyous enthusiasm in Melee for me. And also, you know, it's Smash Brothers. It's really good. And I'm nowhere near good enough to worry about DK being irrelevant in Melee. So, that's a bonus. Start your engine for a Beanox recreation. Never before has a remake impressed me so greatly. The original Crash Team Racing was already my favorite racing game, and assuredly would have fit somewhere on my top 25 or so in an alternate universe version of this list. CTR was a brilliant little title that set out to create a middle ground between the Mario Karts and the F-Zeros of the world, and did so with a cheesy grin and endless confidence. No game appeals to every facet of what makes racers great quite like Crash does. At the base level, you have a fun kart racer, taking the best ideas of Mario Kart 64 and Super Mario Kart and mixing them together, creating incredibly fun tracks with tons of shortcuts, big impressive jumps, and oodles of items that get stronger the more collectibles you nab up around the track. But as you get deeper, start tackling time trials and getting into character mechanics, you find a depth that's usually reserved for the most hardcore of racing titles. The power slide system in CTR is incredible, letting you get up to three mini boosts from a single slide if you line it up just right, rewarding track knowledge and how your weight class handles so nicely. The reserve boost system then combos into that, letting you sustain a turbo boost from a boost pad as long as you keep your mini turbo rhythm going, never stopping, always looking for your next line or a big thing to jump off of to continue maintaining your speed. And then, those two systems, the racing game perfection and the Mario Kart-esque party aspect, come together. Players able to lay traps on the perfect lines to boost through. The careful item balancing act that Mario Kart lives and thrives off of being made another weapon in a player's arsenal, preventing frontrunners from simply treating each course as a time trial. Crash Team Racing looks like a completely different game when played at a basic and a high level, but it's all still using the same mechanics. It's always fun, and everything that the player does to improve naturally leads to getting better at the game's deeper mechanics. Pulling off a perfect race, maintaining blue fire and blasting through a track at ludicrous speed when you can remember it taking twice as long your first go-round, figuring out the best lines and executing them after multiple failed attempts… oh that's racing game perfection to me. To make high-level play look difficult, but accessible, and daring you to try it out. And then Nitro Fueled is like, okay. But what if we kept that, but added more? And also made the game the biggest celebration of Crash Bandicoot imaginable. There is so much love poured into every bit of Nitro Fueled. From its animations, to pulling out obscure characters from every part of the Crash franchise to add to its roster. To restoring the entire set of Crash Nitro Kart tracks to the CTR engine just for the sake of it. Nitro Fueled oozes personality out of every pore, cosmetics and hundreds of unlockables encouraging players to keep going at it. New tracks were added that take even further advantage of CTR's engines and systems. New challenges were added, like even tighter time trials against Emperor Velo or the Ring Rally, which gives newer players a taste of what the high octane speed is like and teaches them what lines to take and how they should best be managing their turbos. Iron Checkpoint Crate, perhaps the greatest racer of all time, exists! And the online matchmaking functions, usually. Nitro Fueled repackaged a game I already loved, added even more to it, 
taught me how to appreciate it all at an even deeper level. If you have any enthusiasm for Mario Kart and wish it played just a little faster, a bit snappier, a bit more F-Zero-E, I can't recommend this game enough. It is flow, challenge, and thrill distilled into its purest form. Whoa! I often think about the god who blessed us with this cryptic puzzle and wonder if we'll ever have the chance to kill him. It's pretty amazing what making a Yoko Taro game actually playable can do, isn't it? To describe what makes Nier Automata great is to do a disservice to the experience of the game itself. I know that sounds like pretentious fluff, but I have never seen a director take such impressive steps to make sure that every leg of the journey they're taking the player on is meaningful and, if not fun, at least interesting. Nier Automata is an absolutely captivating title. Taking the framework of action games like Metal Gear Rising and Bayonetta and expanding them into a full RPG world to explore and connect with. While this does mean that the combat is less intense and, due to RPG customization and leveling, a lot easier than those games, Automata more than makes up for merely being a fun character action playground with its writing, pacing, and characterization. Open world games tend to lose my attention pretty quickly. I'm someone who's gotta pick up every side quest they see before moving on. In most titles, that ends up being a lot of fetching and questing and incremental rewards that make sense for the location they're in, but have little impact on the main character. Automata makes nearly all of its quests meaningful. Each one is a commentary on its world, on its characters, on some aspect, to make your connection to the devastated Earth you roam a little more meaningful. Every weapon doesn't just level up, it has its own story that you uncover a little bit more of every time it's refined. Every conversation is wrapped in discussions of philosophy that presents the obvious questions you'd expect in a story about robots, and then evolves them, taking the questions and ideas further, willing to push everything to its logical extreme. It's a bold, uncompromising game that wants to see its vision through to the very end. And the fact that it manages to do so without collapsing on itself like the entirety of the Drakengard series is incredibly respectable. But ultimately, it's the presentation of the title and the journey that it takes you on that makes it so remarkable. This is one of the most well-voice acted games I've had the pleasure of experiencing with Kira Buckland's slow character transformation as 2B being conveyed almost entirely through her delivery, being a subtle highlight. And Kyle McCarley's performance as 9S is just... one of the best vocal performances in a game, period? The way the music builds on itself and adds to itself, leitmotifs becoming new songs, variations of songs folding into themselves, the simple idea of language becoming a resonant statement used within the music. Few titles can achieve such emotional depth that the game's soundtrack reaches. And of course, the message that the game leaves players with. One that I don't need to explain if you've played the game, and dare not explain if you haven't, is worth going through the game for alone. Automata feels like the ambition of Yoko Taro finally being realized. A complete product in gameplay, story, world, and heart that does absolutely everything it wants to accomplish and gives just a little bit more back to players. Also, space shooter stages. I'm, I'm a sucker for those. This is one of those rare games where I am intensely satisfied with the experience. Will treasure it forever and have no desire to go through it again, only to see others enjoy it in its full splendor. Glory to mankind.
Do you remember that feeling that people had when Pokemon Go first launched in 2016? Everyone getting out, meeting with each other, catching Pokemon together, getting excited about their favorites? Imagine if that feeling spread to every single facet of your life. The shows you watched, the games you played, the little collectibles you got as a kid, the merchandise you saw at the store. That was the feeling of being an elementary school child when Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue came out. Everywhere you went, your peers and friends were talking about Pokemon, comparing favorite Pokemon, picking up tips and tricks about Pokemon in order to create the best possible team, creating rumors and secrets about Pokemon. Just seeing this book fills me with such an intense nostalgia that I can't stand it. It is impossible to remove these games from the culture surrounding them. Just as it's impossible to remove the impressions of people getting into a game like Team Fortress 2, Halo 3, or Overwatch during their most popular periods. As much as I would love to give an unbiased look at these games, these were childhood to me. Not in a way where they defined what video games were to me. For a time, Pokemon was all I cared about. Little guys were everywhere, and I adored living in a Pokemon world. But even saying that all aside, Red and Blue still remain my favorite games out of the series. Are they horribly broken and jank competitive messes with game-destroying exploits and glitches and a lack of quality of life features? Oh, absolutely. But they're also the only Pokemon games that I feel capitalize on Pokemon as an RPG first and as Pokemon games second. Take Onyx, for example. A high-speed, high-defense Pokemon with an abysmal special stat and even more pitiful HP. More than just a collectible monster, Onyx is designed to be a super-imposing first boss. A teaching tool for the player to learn about the difference between physical and special hits. And then the player can catch the first boss later down the road and realize, Oh yeah, he kinda sucks. Psychic and Dragon types are horribly overpowered, but that's kinda alright, because they're not made to be competitively balanced. They're challenges for the player to overcome first, and when they get access to them, they're power fantasies. You get loaded up with an abundance of bugs, birds, and rats early on, and slowly grow into seeing more exotic species like Clefairies, Drowsies, and Machops. Some loser shoving Magikarp on you works wonders when you have no idea that the fish evolves into Gyarados. And even if you do know, not knowing when he'll evolve on a first playthrough makes you wonder if all the effort is really worth it. So much of what we take for granted in Pokemon, the RPG bedrock on which it was founded that's become second nature to players, was created in this game. Not every team composition will work out. Not every encounter is fair. Not every Pokemon will be available when you want them to be. And that's okay. Pokemon Red and Blue, when looked at as RPGs first and Pokemon games second, are just insanely flexible challenges against a uniquely interconnected environment. And I still think the Kanto is the best designed region for a single player experience in the series because of that. Future games in the series would focus on adding more mechanics to battles to make individual matchups more engaging. Focus on the end game, just overall overhaul Pokemon into being a far more competitive series more than it is an RPG. And that's absolutely fine. The series is clearly doing well and people are enjoying it, but it's not why I love Pokemon. Red and Blue made me fall in love with RPGs as much as I loved the Pokémon themselves. And the balance they struck, combined with the environment they created, hasn't been topped to this day. They were simply the very best. And I love them. Not yellow, though. Too limiting on your team composition due to pushing the starter so hard. Willing to bet usually a team's gonna end up looking like... I don't know. Pikachu, Pidgeot, Nidoking, Venusaur, Charizard, and Blastoise, with a Primeape and a Butterfree in the box. I miss Weedle.
And you're forgetting one more very basic thing. You don't have what it takes to kill me. Where do you even start with Metal Gear? It's a series that's fully willing to admit it's very silly, but will throw moments of intense, fun, and creative gameplay at you with story beats ranging from epic to heartfelt to meaningful that you just kind of accept the ride it's taking you on and enjoy every bit of it. And the most tightly tuned ride of all of these is Metal Gear Solid 3. But you're so supreme. What makes MGS3 stand out is probably how outwardly goofy it is. The game clearly loves James Bond, if the amount of Bond trivia and the theme didn't tip you off. And all of the action scenes and stylings take on that very Hollywood presentation, keeping the game a lot crisper than the more military and science fiction inspired stylings of its predecessors. In keeping with the pace of a Bond movie, the script is tightened up, the famously long Metal Gear speech is only getting excessive once or twice, but delivered with suave intrigue due to the devotion to the 60s Cold War aesthetic. The playfulness of the game lets super imaginative but conceptually hilarious bosses be taken at face value, like Photosynthesis Grandpa and Man of Bees and they're just fought as really clever and fun encounters. But what really sets this game apart from the rest of the series is how open-ended it is. MGS has always had really engrossing stealth gameplay, but it's often confined to tight corridors for the majority of its infiltration missions. Figure out the patrol routes, get past them, move on. Metal Gear Solid 3 opens up these environments in a big way, most of MGS3 takes place outdoors in the Russian jungle, with the Soliton radar from previous games removed in favor of a far less positionally accurate sonar system. This makes potential enemy routes a lot harder to dodge, and makes them more engrossing to learn, while also opening up Snake's ways to play around. Capturing local wildlife and setting it loose to spook guards, dunking guards with beehives, setting traps, relying on camouflage to sneak through, being really good at shooting. There are so many options to handling a given scenario, and MGS3's guard AI is just good enough to be a solid challenge while learning it, and just bad enough to be hilariously fun to exploit once you know its secrets. This extends to bosses, giving you bonuses for killing them non-lethally, and stuffing so many easter eggs and references into each one that can give you a temporary boost that no encounter feels the same. There is so much to play with in MGS3. It feels like if you think you could do something cool, the devs have already thought of it and will do everything they can to make sure you can mess with it. Every inch of the game feels purposeful and engaging, and that is an absolute rarity in even the best of titles. And, of course, there's a story to tie it all together. Metal Gear Solid 3 is known as one of gaming's great stories, with the ending being an infamous tearjerker. And... yeah, it's pretty exceptional. Long-winded? Sure, Metal Gear always is. Silly at times? Definitely. But the character work is so strong, and the devotion to its message, fighting against and struggling with the world and the scene that surrounds you, and how it can define who you are, is so absolute that it gets at the raw emotion of what it's dissecting almost effortlessly. Special mention has to go to Lori Allen's portrayal of the boss. She acts the hell out of the role, and ties together the story perfectly, as a matronly figure who's as inspiring and larger than life as she is human and disillusioned. She and everyone else in the cast band together to create something special. A Metal Gear title that doesn't stumble over its own ambition, but one that sees all of its ambitions out to the fullest, and creates a complete, cohesive narrative on top of a fun-as-hell game. 
It's what was once one of gaming's premier franchises at its best in all departments, and it deserves its retirement with full honors. I love 2D platformers, this is the best one. Now, I could probably end things off there, but Donkey Kong Country 2 has so much more to say than merely having mad hops. What sets DKC2 apart is how it manages to take the ideas of so many amazing platformers of its day and revamp them, creating a single engine for all the best aspects of platformers to shine in. You like momentum in your platformer? Bam! DKC2's got some of the best in the business. You can go from a stop to full speed nearly instantly, and your roll increases your speed exponentially, Diddy launching forward in a big burst as long as he keeps ramming into enemies. The control the player has feels so natural that there's rarely a time they need to stop moving forward. Diddy able to perfectly jump from enemy to enemy, launching into obstacles, rolling off of cliffs and leaping forward to get a little extra burst. Levels play out practically rhythmically when pushing through them like this, and it feels so good. You like having a safety net? Well, let me introduce you to Dixie Kong, <laughs> who serves to give players just a little more confidence in where they're going to land, and potentially skip big parts of a level if they line up a glide right. You like Yoshi? We got tons of animal buddies for you to ride on. Now with unique levels designed around their skill sets, so that you can spend even longer with them. Turning what were previously power-ups into heroes and challenges in their own right. You want secrets to get even more challenges? Well, DKC2 wrote the book on great bonus level placement, inventing the team throw for Diddy and Dixie to traverse to new heights and increasing their flexibility, letting players take it slow and comb over the level for any suspicious areas, being rewarded with an entire hidden world piece by piece for their efforts. You want bosses that don't suck? Captain K rules right there, dude. You want personality and cartoon sensibilities? Diddy and Dixie are incredibly expressive. The sound design of the Kremlin crew is top notch to make squishing and smashing them feel amazing. And Cranky Kong's glad to complain right in your face as long as you need in every single regard. In trying to push itself forward and be the best platformer it can be, Donkey Kong Country 2 succeeds. But the very best part of DKC2 is how it's never satisfied with itself. Every single level has a unique gimmick to play with, or builds off of a previous level's ideas and remixes it to include an animal buddy, or wind, or a slowly encroaching liquid of death. But all these ideas don't override the core of Donkey Kong Country 2, tight, momentum-based platforming. With the possible exception of Web Woods, every level still feels like Donkey Kong Country, presenting you with challenging jumps and egging you on to take just the right opportunity to press forward. DKC2 is one of those rare platformers where every level is memorable, every encounter meaningful, and every inch of the game brought out to its fullest. Others may lean into Tropical Freeze's very cinematic flow of levels, watching incredibly fun set pieces mix into each other to create a euphoric series of desperate reactions to try and survive. And while that has its own strengths and is an excellent game, man, there is nothing better than getting that feeling solely because the game just plays that damn well. Donkey Kong Country 2 is the right kind of challenge. One that can be relentless when you're learning it, but one that makes you want to see just what it'll throw at you next. And one that you want to revisit over and over again, because playing around with Diddy and Dixie just feels that good.
Kirby Superstar was my first video game. Not the first game I remember playing. My, my mom owned a Super Nintendo before I was born. I'm sure I have vague memories of Mario World and Donkey Kong Country before I do Kirby. But Superstar was the game I first truly felt comfortable with. It was my introduction to the language of video games. How good and how powerful you can feel while playing. How fun it is to play with others and share an experience together. How triumphant you feel when you beat down a horrifying final boss. And the sense of peace and accomplishment that comes from looking at hard-earned credits. I am truly happy just thinking about Kirby Superstar. And that intangible feeling of nostalgia is something that I can't possibly quantify. Fortunately, Kirby Superstar is also the best beat-em-up of all time, so that lets my fanboyism feel slightly less biased. What I love about Superstar is just how flexible it is for a beat-em-up game. Platforming might as well be non-existent most of the time, given how many jumps Kirby and his partners have. But that freedom allows for super varied terrain to fight enemies on. Vertical attacks and positioning mean a ton in Kirby, while other excellent contemporaries like Turtles in Time or Final Fight would find them annoyances. Copy abilities have been expanded to have varied movesets that not only give Kirby a ton of range to deal with opponents, but opens up tons of movement options. You look forward to seeing enemies in Kirby, figuring out the best way to mess with them, and finding creative applications for your powers. And with the generally low difficulty, and especially how forgiving the game is toward the second player, you can experiment to your heart's content. And with the different game modes highlighting different types of level design, Great Cave Offensive being based around exploration, Meta Knight being about speed, Milky Way being an experimental combination of both, the player is encouraged, naturally, to keep finding new ways to use all their abilities. It's a game that wants you to have fun with everything it has every second of the way, mixing in puzzles, platforming, and oodles of combat to make sure you're fully engaged at every turn. So, why this one above any other Kirby game, especially the excellent ones in the post-Return to Dreamland world, and more specifically, why not Superstar Ultra? Well, Superstar is short, and it focuses on co-op. I can plow through this game with a friend, start to finish 100% in about 3 or 4 hours now that I know where everything is. And that's including just messing around, playing with abilities, enjoying the systems that make Kirby up. Having a fun, easy to commit to experience where everyone gets to have fun is a surprising rarity. One that beat-em-ups tend to live and die on. Kirby Superstar perfects this. And the single-screen co-op is a lot easier to set up than getting two DS's together, admittedly. And a lot more of a shared experience. It excellently teaches you the language of games, is fun to explore every inch of, and always reliable to come back to for a good time. It's a perfect little experience all its own, and I love the little guy for it. Thanks, pal. My mother was the one who got me into video games. I would watch her play before I knew how to read, and actually would pick up how to read by looking at strategy guides, and then associating the words therein with the pictures on screen. She wasn't particularly good at video games, but she gave me an appreciation for trying again and again until you finally get something down. However, with the coming of the Nintendo 64, she found herself playing games less and less. The 3D perspective of games and the sudden jerking of early cameras gave her motion sickness, and she didn't much care for traversing 3D space compared to the cleaner simplicity of 2D. While she would eventually become really good at Pokemon Puzzle League and has never moved on from that, there's one game that I remember as our final adventure together, before I became the resident video game expert in the house. 
And that game was the one we got with our Nintendo 64. Banjo-Kazooie. My preschool-age brain was utterly mesmerized by this game. Vibrant environments, playful music that changed as you went into different areas, constant dialogue from a very snarky and somewhat jaded cast, little noises for everything you picked up. Every patch of grass and collectible was important to me, and I remembered every bit of it. Fortunately, my mother's uh, talents extended to this title as well, as I'm pretty sure we're the only duo to ever need 90 hours of in-game time to beat Banjo. So I was able to eat up every bit of Grunty's lair to my heart's content. There is no game I know better than this one. No set of stages I can picture so vividly in my mind's eye. I remembered absolutely everything about this game. So... Guess what game has a final boss that rewards you for memorization? A certain quiz show where you have to remember very specific facts about Gruntilda, figure out locations based on zoomed-in pictures, remember the names of all the friends you made along the way? Banjo-Kazooie was the torch-passing moment, where I became confident enough to be the hero who could save princesses and thwart villains where I knew video games weren't just something I liked, they were something I loved. There is more to Banjo than just nostalgia for me. The game is built to make you care about its worlds, from the way the notes guide you to every point of interest in a level, to the way that every area has a funny new friend to interact with. Movement is silky smooth, the freedom that you get from flight is astonishing, and requires its levels to be more than just platforming challenges. And Banjo's difficulty curve is actually really solid if you're trying to nab all the notes in one life. It's a game that's designed from its core, to make the simple act of collection itself fun. One that wastes absolutely no time in any of its levels. One that you can tell the devs really delighted in and had fun with designing. I don't think Banjo-Kazooie is the best 3D platformer ever made. The most engaging it ever gets in that regard is going in a circle around a big tree. However, I do think it's the best use of 3D space in a video game and making all of the places you can explore in it meaningful and fun. And trust me, it's something I'll be talking more in depth about very soon. By spending time with you all, I change day by day. It frightened me before, but now, with everyone, with you, I can proudly proclaim that I am myself. Nothing more, but nothing less. Persona 4, firstly, is a really good RPG. It takes some of the best elements from games earlier in the Shimigami Tensei series and transforms them into a more accessible system, but not a less deep one. The press-turn system of Nocturne, the demon fusion of classic SMT, the Velvet Room features of the PlayStation Persona titles. Persona 3 was able to create a strong and unique foundation for all of these systems to thrive in. Persona 4, then, picks up where 3 leaves off and executes these ideas on a higher level. The massive depths of Tartarus are divided into individual dungeons, each with a boss 10 levels higher than the previous, letting players pace out their runs and arrive at challenges at a competitive, but unless you overgrind, hardly comfortable level during their first run-through. The social link system of Persona 3 is refined, letting the player bond more closely with party members, giving each one in-battle benefits the more the player bonds with them. Rather than the fatigue system, SP limits how far a player can delve into dungeons, creating a more natural endpoint to each excursion as the player runs out of their ability to snipe enemy weaknesses and easily clear encounters. And, of course, the fact that everything supports every other system remains strong as ever. 
In Persona, you manage your time to grow closer to your friends, which improves the strength of your Personas of their Arcana, while also giving you benefits, which lets you go deeper into dungeons, which earns you more money, which you can spend on equipment and friends and Personas so you can get stronger Personas and grow closer to your friends so you can get stronger in the dungeons and... Yeah. It's such a comfortable loop that melts hours upon hours away. Combining the best aspects of monster recruitment RPGs, dating sims, and traditional dungeon crawlers to make just a wonderful experience. And I will say, I think the PS2 version is probably the last Persona game to have the impression of challenge in it. I just like a little bit of spice. However, the strongest draw of Persona 4 is its characters. Not just how they're written, though these are some really nicely penned teenagers, but in how the entire theme of the game revolves around their character arcs. The crux of Persona 4 is the mysterious TV world, another realm that a suspected serial murderer tosses victims inside, where they're exposed to the parts of themselves they'd most like to hide and deny made manifest. You delve into these dungeons made of insecurities, see the ones suffering from it, watch them lash out against it, and then accept these doubts as a part of who they really are. And it doesn't end there. After they've accepted themselves, they still need to work on what they want to do with that. It's up to you to choose how you manage your time, who you help realize everything they want to and can be, knowing that you probably don't have time to help everyone you want, but you'll still need to make the most of what time you do have. Connections to the characters of Persona 4 are strong. The game containing some of my favorite interactions in all of video games. Kanji Tatsumi, Risei Kujikawa, and Naoto Shirogane especially. The game doesn't shy away from difficult subject matter either. Sexuality, sensuality, identity, nihilism, emptiness. All things a teenager might struggle with are brought up. And while not every topic is handled with absolute tact, it fully illustrates the messy struggle that young adults just discovering themselves have with these ideas. That there isn't a clear cut or easy answer, there's just a wholly unique you trying to handle it in your own way until you figure out what works. And around you are your friends, family, everyone going through that same struggle. And when you reach out to someone, and they reach back, using each other as support, that bond is the strength you need to pursue it to its fullest. And that's just a beautiful message to me. One that's put into every last bit of Persona 4's design, from its gameplay to its writing to its music. It's a game devoted to the truth of the human experience, and that's wonderful. I'd like to end this list, though, with the reason that this game will always be my favorite. It goes into dwelling on some teen angst, I'll admit, so if you're not up for it, trust me, I totally get it. But uh, it's highly important to me and why I love video games so dang much, so if you're up for it, thanks for hearing me out. When I was 15, I was in a rough state, mentally speaking. I'd been told all my life that I was brilliant, far more so than my peers, and I totally believed it. Every academic subject I was able to conquer almost effortlessly. Every talk with the teacher went flawlessly. Every non-athletic extracurricular I did, I was a star in. The only thing that truly decayed was my relationship with my peers. Based on my surroundings, I was clearly better than them. Thinking on a higher level, finding excuses to dismiss what they were into as I went back to my standbys of Nintendo and academic achievement. And this awful haughtiness continued until eventually, things didn't become effortless. I'd intentionally skip assignments to prove I could make the grade with as little effort as possible, and anxiety would build inside me as I left myself in a situation where anything I didn't instantly understand, I would shun. I started doing worse, and by my own design, I had no one to turn to. 
Eventually, I started deleting my own work after completing it, proving that I could do it, but not feeling like I was worthy of turning it in. Interactions with anyone forced my mind into choice paralysis, so scared that I would say something wrong or something that would make me look foolish that I just froze up when making decisions. Wrapped in silence and hoping someone would just choose the right answer for me, I withdrew from school, unable to will myself to go, just wallowing in my failure. Pride turning into shame and then into regret. I fell down the dangerous pathway where I felt I was broken. I was a burden on everyone around me who took interest, hoping I'd come around, trying to help. I felt that I was someone that everyone would be better off without. The day I planned to act on these thoughts, my little sister was stuck at home with a cold. So, to entertain her, like my mom did for me, I played a video game for her. And the game I chose that day, the one that I'd barely ever played before, was Persona 4. And let me tell you, does Persona 4 do a good job of making you feel connected if you got a bond with your little sister? Persona 4 was everything I needed at that moment. It forced me to make choices, constantly, whether they be right or wrong, taking responsibility for each one. It showed me that my pain wasn't exclusive to myself, that everyone struggled and had their own doubts that you don't just get over, but you work at it, repeatedly over days and weeks and months, to be a better version of yourself. It even had an incredibly smart character who distanced themselves from their peers whilst working toward an ideal that seemed unattainable. It made me feel like it was okay to doubt, to question, to struggle, to not have all the right answers or even a definitive answer to what I'm supposed to be doing. You just have to trust in you and those close to you and work at it. And slowly, I felt like I had a purpose again. It wasn't an easy climb. I struggled getting back up to speed in school and was still kind of naturally an egotistical jerk toward peers for a while. But it was one I knew I could accomplish. And today, over a decade later, I'm proud of what I've overcome and what kind of person I am, even if I'm still growing. And <laughs> I have a video game to thank for that. Persona 4 taught me just how strong of healing tools video games could be, asking you to invest a bit of yourself in as you play, and giving back equal to how much you care. It reminded me that games as a whole are these wonderful things that had been with me my whole life, that I want to carry with me for the rest of my life, that I want to share with others and know their experiences to ask what their favorite game is and what it means to them. Nostalgia, mastery, escapism, connectivity, competition, existentialism. Games can bring so much out of all of us. What each of us values most being different brought out through a different title, but none more inherently meaningful than the other. Persona 4 taught me that games can change lives firsthand. And I'll always owe it one for that, no matter how many spin-offs it's pumping out at me, or how awkwardly cringy it might sound. Of all the wonderful games I've experienced, and the ones that make up my likes and interests and philosophies on games, it's my favorite. Thank you for listening to me talk about it.